Yeah, let's uh, <clears throat> let's get started. Um, for those who do not know me, my name is Gerhard Lapp, and I'm working and part, be part of a pre-sales team here in Boca Raton, um, working on or with customers on uh, solutions, on prototype solutions, and uh, providing examples and uh, um, uh, architecture uh, uh, files, working with the customers. Uh, to ensure and to prove our functionality. Um, I'm honored actually to have this opportunity here to introduce you um, device-wise. Um, as a refresher course, we only have 30 minutes, which is not much, but I like to put device-wise in a different perspective um, and remind you that IoT or I IoT is not something which was suddenly invented, uh, but it is rather something which was a consequence of an industrial revolution starting somewhere in the 1800s. And so we are currently in an era which is called Industry 4.0, and as a consequence, IoT was a necessity uh, as a result of this industrial revolution. And that gives us an incredible opportunity when we are looking at DeviceWise to use as a solution because DeviceWise is offering something our competitors cannot offer. And I hope that I can get the point across during the session here that we understand that we actually have an opportunity uh, to change uh, the industry in terms of how we can process data, manage data, distribute data, uh, and create an infrastructure for the customer, any customer, um, who allows him and enables him to become in control of his data throughout his infrastructure and enterprise. Screen sharing. Yeah. This is a slide which probably many of you know and realize uh, where do you get the I.O. for the IoT? And it was actually national instruments who created the term big analog data, a term trademarked by national instruments. And it comes simply from dozens to thousands of sensors and devices spread across your assets, facility, or entire fleet. And please realize that we have been separating device-wise and device-wise solutions among factory, for example, or among uh, uh, portal deployments and platform deployments, uh, where we look at distributed sensors or uh, remote sensors. Um, at the end, the key is what we are capable to do is not only collect data and different types of data, which are coming from sensors, measuring vibration, pressure, and flow, or cameras performing thermal scanning and pattern matching, or motors sending precise waveforms to execute control algorithms. It is all about the data point itself, and as a consequence, in a hyper-connected world, regardless where it is or where it resides or who is managing, regardless of machines, infrastructures, devices, the data are the key and they come from anywhere. This is very critical to understand and a lot of companies offer solutions in an uh, old-fashioned way that they simply focus on, okay, let's read a data point and then what to do with it. And we are much more advanced, and I hope that I can get this point across during this presentation, uh, in which points we are advanced at what is actually required to manage data in a distributed uh, environment. I put this slide up to show you the Industrial Revolution timeline, and you see that um, close to 2000 is where the Industry 4.0 became, um, or was kind of announced by many governments actually, and it has again nothing to do with factory or manufacturing. It is, IoT is an evolution based on the Industrial Revolution over the time starting with the 1800s. So there was no data collected or present, basically, in the first and second uh, um, industry era um, because it was all based on mechanics. Uh, whether it was a production line or anything else, it was a mechanical solution. Uh, even assembly lines that were mechanical, 
And then with the revolution of Industry 3.0 is where companies start automating assembly lines and stations, and the only purpose of collecting data, whether they came from sensors or they came from PSDs, was simply to visualize and to control assembly lines, and then eventually maybe connect the MES systems or ERP systems, but for the longest time in Industry 3.0, even until today, ERP systems never had an interest in uh, processing real-time data. Um, the most famous one is SAP uh, because their motto was always that um, real-time data, our statistical analysis uh, predictions are sufficient enough uh, to calculate the load of any manufacturing or assembly line and uh, to define uh, the needs for, for manufacturing, for example. But with today's trend uh, enabled by Industry 4.0, when we look at Industry 3.0, the structure among all the different components we connect um, it's, was very well based on, on hardware. Uh, it was extremely static. Triangle, uh, which was created to separate process management with production management and um, um, uh, uh, the ex executive management. And functions were based on hardware, not based on end users. And it all allowed you to create and automate isolated products. Uh, the requirement of Industry 4.0 is completely different in terms of that now. Uh, anyone wants to create smart products and use smart products. So they not only want to produce a product, but they also want to understand the utilization of the product in the field. Uh, let's, let's take the example of a lawnmower, for example, and we as Talit already uh, connected uh, or worked with lawnmower companies, and we may have uh, more opportunities in the, in the future. The, uh, the lawnmower is a, is a perfect example as a consequence because you not only need to manufacture the lawnmower, but now you can actually utilize and see in real time how uh, or where a lawnmower is being used, what its uh, utilization is, and so on. So it's not just a manufacturing process, but it is also following the product in the real world where they are being used. And be, Beyond this uh, utilization, uh, we require a smart factory, meaning that we actually can watch and see in real time how our product and manufacturing process is, is doing. So for this, we need flexible machines and systems, functions distributed through the network, communications and cooperation among all levels of connected applications, which ends up in a truly hyper-connected world. Why do companies, no matter what they produce, no matter what their goal is, do need to upgrade? The bottom line and the short answer is simply they need to stay connected literally. Um, there are short-term benefits if they upgrade and move on is, of course, improve product quality, increase speed of operations, decrease manufacturing costs, improve maintenance and update, agility and responsiveness. Uh, the long-term values are in increased revenues because of an improved customer experience, more innovation, and I think the most important thing is the potential for higher product mix, meaning that you not only can use the same assembly line to produce one product, but you can use the same assembly line with minor changes to produce many products, which is a huge advantage. And then the other thing is that now your vendors basically can join your production, whatever it is, because of the capability of they can connect and plug in into your data infrastructure and data environment. The next few slides I want to show and introduce is the conventional 
way we currently publish our device rights. Uh, so in other words, the, you need to understand that DeviceWise is a software agent, and I feel like we are not promoting enough the benefits of DeviceWise. Please remember that DeviceWise as a software agent is hardware and software independent. It's, a, it's a, an agent which you install on many hardware platforms, and we keep uh, pushing this and we keep porting DeviceWise so that we can run on existing hardware that companies do not have to change anything. So one of the key factors is that DeviceWise runs on many platforms. The next step is that DeviceWise has a huge library of interfaces available to you. In other words, um, for example, I would rather see an asset gateway used in a lawnmower as an example than trying to convince the customer if they want to de develop and um, write their own firmware or even their hardware board uh, because there are features which DeviceWise offers which would take a very long time for customers to reproduce. Uh, if I can uh, remind you, features like uh, store and forward, redundancy, uh, different means of reading data, things like this, which we're going to get a little later in this presentation. What's so important about device-wise, why it should be used rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. The advantage of device-wise is that it allows you to connect the different layers uh, by using simply uh, um, which we call actions and trigger logic. Um, the key about this is that we provide a huge library of enterprise access layers, whether it's to our portal, whether it's to other platforms, whether it's SAP, Oracle database, and the device access layer. We keep developing new and adding new drivers uh, from now we start adding robot interfaces for Fano, for example, and we keep adding, as you know, sensors and different mechanisms using Bluetooth, Wi-Fi uh, interfaces uh, to device-wise as device access layer in order to increase and be current with the latest technology. What device-wise, when we use device-wise, when we use the asset gateway at the edge, what this enables us is actually exactly um, the, 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 this, this uh, layout and this um, image uh, is a very good image because it shows all the different layers and all the different tiers within which I call a data-centric infrastructure. Our device-wise has a capability to manage this data-centric infrastructure. So we as Pellet cannot only or do not only come in as someone who can connect two components like a sensor uh, with something else or wherever this data goes, but when we use device-wise as a uh, strategic tool within a corporation, we can create a data-centric infrastructure so that anyone who comes in and wants to connect to this data-centric infrastructure uh, can do it by using device-wise. So in other words, we can standardize the data within a network or within an infrastructure. Um, when we talk to our competitors, it's always that everyone is saying we collect data, uh, but the problem is by just collecting data, you are not resolving the IoT challenges. You need to do much more than just simply trying to read the data or write the data. You need also to manage the data, and I'll explain later why that is. You need to be able to distribute the data vertical and horizontal. I call this, you can implement the data logistics uh, with device-wise. And then last but not least, you have to have the ability to transform the data. And not many systems uh, can do this uh, in such a way uh, we, we have the ability to do this. And this is the benefit what, if you use an asset gateway, you will have to, to do and to provide. So in other words, the insight to make your operation smarter or more efficient lives within its collective sets of data 
to extract those insights, you need to collect, manage, distribute, and transform the data, allowing you to effectively analyze and process the data. We collect data in real time. Every other vendor will tell you, I can do this too. What the others do not do in this context is to answer the question, what is actually required to effectively collect data? Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the OPC world in the manufacturing environment, or you use LoRa or um, any other mechanism to read the data. In many cases, you are limited to the driver functionality uh, someone wrote to access this information. And this is exactly where we have an advantage because when we write a native driver, and this is also very important that we provide native drivers and not use libraries or, or some other uh, mechanisms. Um, so in other, because having the ability to write native drivers gives you the, um, the ability that you can uh, process the data in different forms. So in other words, you become flexible. Sometimes you need to read individual text, like an analog value, process value, speed, velocity, whatever. But many times, for example, if you want to use data collection for, uh, for analysis, for big data analysis, for statistics, uh, the statistical people are not interested in individual process values but they are interested in a whole, an entire array of a chunk of data. Uh, in other words, you want to be able to read hundreds of uh, megabytes of data. Or if you use a camera interface, you want to be able to stream data. And for that purpose, you have to have the capability to use a native driver, which we always do to provide functionality that we can uh, uh, read strings and binary based data collections, bulk and or arrays, unsolicited message support, and so on, FTP and HTTP support, or use shared drive technology that we can use uh, or pick up data from, from um, a shared drive in form of a file. Um, so the data collection should not be limited to available device features but extend to end user requirements like streaming, mapping, packaging, et cetera. This is the first reason why you should always consider to use an asset gateway versus trying the customer and trying to do things yourself. Uh, it is, again, a firmware, a software agent we have developed, which is very robust, very stable, and besides the capability of reading individual points, you have the capability to collect your data in many different ways. The second reason why you should consider using asset gateways before anything else, if possible, of course, is you need to manage data. It's not enough to read an I.O. point and then send it to the portal, send it to a backend system or to somewhere else. The reason for this is many times you have or you are not in control in which you need to collect the data in terms of speed and performance or quantity. So in other words, when you send data to the portal or to databases or different systems, you may have different bottlenecks somewhere in between. You don't know. So if that's the case, you have to be able to manage the data locally until the bottleneck is resolved, and then you can feed the data back again to the upper systems uh, in order to process. The other reason why you need to manage data, let's assume you receive or request responses, so you send information to the portal uh, and to ERP systems, and you expect a response back. Many times the response is much slower than your device you're communicating with, so the speed in which both sides are operating are completely different. So for that, the response may take several days uh, while you need to wait, or whatever the reason is, why you need to wait for the response to arrive. In other words, you now need to have the capability to locally store that information so that you can 
app to respond to the proper uh, request. To standardize the data among different systems, the end user should not have to be concerned about different data types and data presentations among two systems. The data presentation remains transparent regardless of its origin. That's the third very important point. In other words, when you move your data environment into device-wise using an asset gateway, the data itself become transparent to anyone who can use or uses asset gateways anywhere else on any other location. Suddenly, you can connect customers through the portal to asset gateways somewhere running uh, remote, uh, whether it's this lawnmower example or fleet management or anything else. You have a complete, transparent, and consistent um, data view within your device-wise environment. So look at it like as a spider web where you have all the different asset gateway nodes uh, which you suddenly can share and very easily share data um, no matter to which systems they are connected. And uh, sometimes I feel we are not taking enough advantage of this capability. Last but not least, the data distribution. So I call it actually data logistics. Um, to give you an example, let's assume you have a one-way street going into New York City at rush hour. Uh, you see immediately what's happening, uh, that there is a bottleneck, the traffic jam, it's going to take you hours to get there. Uh, you're going to be late no matter what. Uh, Device-wise, on the asset gateway or enterprise gateway, and I'll get to this in a little bit, uh, what the difference is, um, have the capability that you can create concurrent connections. No other system, whether any HMI or SCADA system, any other IoT solution cannot do this. They don't have the capability to create concurrent connections, whether it's to the device or whether it's to the transport layers uh, where you connect databases, where you connect portals, uh, where you connect different systems. Uh, DeviceWise has the ability to create uh, two lanes, three lanes, four lanes, in order to widen up the street, allowing you to minimize any bottlenecks or to even resolve bottlenecks. And then DeviceWise has also a capability which a lot of people are not aware of the fact. Let's assume you use two different asset gateways. You could actually reroute, let's say one asset gateway for any has an issue to connect to a target, let's say it cannot connect to the portal, if it is networked within a local network infrastructure, it could use a second asset gateway as a reroute option to send the information if needed or required. So not only distribution means that you can create multiple concurrent connections, but you can reroute your message kind of using a different route uh, to your target system. So in general, data logistics allows you to effectively route and package your data using several pathways within your network capabilities. For example, it is critical for data which are collected at the same time to stay together until they reach their target endpoint. To provide a variety of transport capabilities, including concurrency among different systems, to offer alternative pathways for backup and failover scenarios, and to offer different feedback mechanisms based on what the originating system requires. So all those four components are components none of our competition can offer, which we have built in into our asset gateway functionality. Now, what's the difference between an asset gateway and an enterprise gateway? Basically, it is the same source code, the same solution, and the only difference is that an enterprise gateway has a built-in transport layer, um, which the asset gateway does not have, and the built-in transport layer allows you to connect directly to ERP systems, uh, databases, and message handlers. Um, 
And the reason why they didn't put this into the asset gateway, for example, is many times an asset gateway runs on low, small resource kind of environment. Um, even though today, when you look at the Raspberry Pis and all the single computer boards available, they have plenty of horsepower uh, allowing you to, to run Java applications and Java interfaces, which are uh, for most of the time required to um, to connect uh, to uh, to other systems. Um, we are coming already to the end. Um, I like to give you one example to show you actually live um, what an asset gateway can do. Let me bring up a workbench here. We all are very familiar with with um, so this is an enterprise gateway. The only reason it's an enterprise gateway because he has the enterprise tab. And the reason I'm showing you this is because uh, to explain the term transparency, what it means. So in other words, you have a connection to a database and you see it's the same interface than if you would connect to a web service like AccuWeather so in other words, there's an HTTP type and there's a database type. In AccuWeather, it's a little bit different configuration where you provide a URL, but from that point on, everything becomes transparent. So when you communicate with device wise to AccuWeather or you communicate with device wise to a database, you don't even know the difference as a user and you don't care and you don't have to worry about it anymore. With any other system you're trying to use, you will have to have detailed knowledge about each individual system, whether it's a web service or whether it's a database. And just to show you, for example, the dynamics possible, when you dynamically can connect to um, web services, you see here that we have a transport, which we call AccuWeather, we use two variables because we would like to know the zip code dependent weather where we type in a zip code and then we get the weather information from the service. And then of course, AccuWeather requires a token uh, which we need to provide, but those are parameters we can pass and there is no limit of parameters we can pass. And then the simple trigger is nothing but one action and you see here, you have a transaction which is identical whether you talk to MSSQL, Oracle, SAP, the AccuWeather service, it's all the same. And then within this transaction, you provide your zip code, you provide your API key, and then you receive your output, which is an XML-based uh, format, which you get from the web service usually. And then all you have to do is execute this one trigger. And then if we look at our reports, Here we just 10, 17 on this. And uh, hold on. Here it is. Sorry. So you see in the transaction where we pass the two parameters based on zip code as an example. And then the response from the web service is the XML based information. And then here you see a country ID and so on, all this information uh, which is in there from the actual weather. Um, so I like to at this point conclude, uh, I have to conclude this, this session at this point. 
and um, hopefully Adrian can help me. If there are any questions, please feel free to, I'm trying to unmute. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please raise your hand or send a message in chat so we can unmute you. Yeah, but does that indicate somebody having a question? Uh, one question, can you please explain which devices support asset gateway versus enterprise gateway? There, again, there is no difference. Any device you can install, any device package, whether it's a fan or controller, a PLC, different sensors, any device package uh, running on both either asset gateway or enterprise gateway, there is no difference. The same goes with the functionality. Uh, they are both 100% compatible. The only difference between enterprise gateway and asset gateway is the fact that you cannot communicate uh, to a database. Let me show you uh, in, in, in this transport layer here when we create a new transport. So in other words, this would not be available to you from an asset gateway point of view uh, to, to connect to SAP, for example, to connect to databases, uh, to use an HTTP transport, for example, uh, but anything else uh, you, you can do if you have asset gateways. And there's always, it's an architecture question uh, at the end. Maybe it's always advised to have at least one enterprise gateway in a whole set of asset gateways, for example. But you can install asset gateway on a hosted environment just like enterprise gateway. You just don't have that, the enterprise That is true, too, yes. It's not just for a physical asset gateway. Right, exactly. But the, as a result of this, this session, um, I would always push to use an asset gateway on the edge before, before anything else, before getting into firmware, before getting into writing C code, uh, Python or what it is, because the asset gateway has functionalities. Uh, it's a 24-7 it's a well-proven software, which you would have to write a lot of code to get even close from a security point of view, from a safety point of view, uh, and from a, a, a functionality point of view to get to, to that level what the access gateway is offering. Okay, and I don't see any other questions, so I think we can end. So uh, we recorded this session and uh, later on we'll, we'll post it for anybody who wants to have a copy of it. And then if you have any follow-up questions that we weren't able to address on the call, feel free to email out to uh, Gearhart or Adrian here, and we'll try to get you an answer. So thank you everybody who was able to join. Thank you very much, bye-bye.